Some brief introductions. Um, my name is Ashley Stolman. I'm one of the conservation directors serving with Conservation Nebraska. We are so excited for you to be here. I'm excited for you to be here. This is going to be sort of a kickoff event here with Crystal Powers, who is the research and extension communication specialist for the Nebraska Water Center. It's gonna be the first in a series of events that will explore water quality topics in Nebraska, how it impacts you, and then what we can learn to do about it. Um, a couple of reminders before we get officially started. You are muted and your cameras are off so that you cannot be seen or heard. If you have any questions, please feel free um, to pop them into the chat box, as well as the Menti interactive box that Crystal just mentioned, um, and we'll go over them at the end. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded, so if you do miss anything, it will be posted on our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. Um, and the speaker, Crystal, today will be presenting some interactive polling questions throughout the presentation. There will also be a short poll, poll from our end that pops up at the very end of the presentation that we at Conservation Nebraska would really appreciate you filling out so that we can continue to host our events and learn how to improve our events. So with that all being said, we'll dive into our water conversation with Crystal and learn about what we can do to ensure Nebraskans all have access to clean drinking water. So take it away. Thanks so much. Yep, as she said, I work with the Nebraska Water Center and I also have hats with Nebraska Extension and the Water for Food Institute here. Um, generally water is the unifying theme across all of that. So now I gotta figure out. Let me try again. It might be just doing the thing where you have to read. Oh, there we go. Best laid plans. Okay, so that being said, um, uh, this is part of a really large effort to think about how we re-engage uh, nitrate uh, in our drinking water across the state. We started in 2020, right pre-pandemic, so it's been a a little bit slow going, but we've had several collaborative meetings um, through various formats in that throughout the pandemic. And so we've got um, pushing 40 organizations uh, across several different sectors. So we've got academia like myself, but then we also have NGOs like Conservation Nebraska and many others, um, the, acad the agriculture sector, and then local, state, uh, federal, and tribal um, governmental folks. So we're trying to find ways to work together. And so this is a piece of that. Um, so our first interactive question, if you haven't logged in again, the link's there at the top or in the, um, or it's over in the chat. So I'll give everyone just a minute. So you just click on the map where you're from. So I know this is the first question, so I'll give everybody a little bit of time to make their way into the system. And if you have any troubles, share it in the chat. But we should see people's, oh, there we go. There's our first dot. And we should see a few more here as people get logged in. Awesome, here I'll put it in the chat again, just in case you missed it. Yeah, and you can post it in the chat too. That's quite all right if we, if you um, aren't able to join in from here. So I've got four now, and I know there's just a few of us online but I'll give it just a little bit longer so you guys can get used to it. We will have several more questions through here that I'd love uh, for you to participate if you can. Awesome, so we've got a couple in Lincoln, Omaha, and then west of Grand Island, maybe. Not too far, maybe, no, Cairo is a little bit further up Highway 2. 
And a couple more from Lincoln. Awesome. Well, I'm going to move us to the next question. Um, feel free to jump in uh, when you get the chance. Oh, sorry. It's a little slow. I got to deal with the delay. So next question is just to gauge what are some of your thoughts about Nebraska's water? And so these are a one to five scale. So you can vote on where you land on this scale. Being proud of the water, feeling connected to it. Do you do things already to protect our water? And this is fun because we'll get to see everybody's results pop up right away. We got our first couple. Super fun. Oh, yep. So not surprisingly, those of us on the call are concerned about water and care about our water. And doing things ourselves, maybe want our state to do a little bit more. Awesome. Very cool. And I'll share all these out. Um, if people want to see what others thought. So with that. So just, you know, as, as most of you know, since you're already um, well connected with Nebraska's water, it's one of um, the resources that we are very fortunate to have in the state. We've got abundant groundwater supplies. You know, in some places it's decreasing, but overall we have quite a lot of high quality groundwater that's available for um, human and non-human use across the state, as well as one of the states with the largest number of river miles across the whole country. And so this is, this is definitely something that I think we're, we can all be a little proud of, and then we just need to think about how we're going to manage it into the future. So for today, uh, I'm going to do kind of a really high level overview of this topic. Um, with the chance at the end to say how you are interested in digging into it more. As, as Ashley said, we're going to have more in-depth presentations about the topics that you're interested in. So we're going to start out talking about a few of the issues, um, look more deeply into are you personally impacted, and then what can we all do. So for, to kick us off with some of our challenges, um, water is really a connecting point for most of the aspects of what goes on in our life, whether we think about it or not. So we, we can talk about water from a quality of life standpoint, whether that's recreating out on the water or the water that we all drink. It's helping us grow the food that we grow here in Nebraska. It connects to the vitality of our rural communities, whether that's because they're an agricultural base or the water that they themselves drink. And then it connects into what's um, the legacy in those rural areas. How are we going to pass on um, these farms and this water to the next generation? With that being said, um, nitrate is one of the largest, um, most commonly found agrochemicals in our water. And where it comes from is fertilizer, mostly commercial fertilizers, um, inorganic sources uh, that, are, that are put onto our crop fields. And the challenge with that is, is that leads to a whole host of health impacts. So back in the 1940s, they found kind of this, what I, what I have listed as a definitive link between blue baby syndrome or met hemoglobinemia which is when an infant drinks water that's high in nitrate, whether that's, uh, that's usually from making formula that's mixed with this water. Infants don't have the enzymes to break it down and therefore it binds to the hemoglobin in, in the baby's body and doesn't allow oxygen uh, to get to their system. So this is what the EPA's safe drinking water threshold is based on, which is 10 parts per million. So remember that number as we go through. Um, 
10 is based on this um, blue baby syndrome data from, from almost 100 years ago. Um, but more recent research is finding there's significant links to several types of cancer, particularly pediatric cancer and colorectal cancer, um, as well as several negative birth outcomes, whether those are birth defects or early term pregnancies, as well as thyroid disease. And there was a recent study that looked at across the U.S., um, elevated nitrate in our drinking waters can can have 250 million to over a, a billion and a half dollars each year in health impacts. And, and so it's nothing uh, that we want to sneeze at, as, as some people would say. The other main impact that we're dealing with is um, the economic vitality. So we talked about the health cost. Um, now I'm looking more at some of the other costs that are associated with that. So in Nebraska, currently there's 99 public water supplies. So that's referring to um, anything from small villages um, to larger towns. So there's 99 of our small communities, even up to our larger communities that have nitrate above five, five parts per million. And with that trending upward, once it crosses that 10 threshold that I mentioned before, then they have to invest in water filtration. So this becomes an economic challenge because that's a multi-million dollar investment. And then if you look at private wells across the state, which we'll dig into to some of these a bit more. When you look at private wells, those aren't um, regulated by anyone. So we don't know who's drinking what type of water. And so based on the maps of where groundwater nitrate is high, it's likely there's probably thousands of private drinking wells that need filtration. Some, of, some people have filters, some don't, we just really don't know. But that's a cost to those private well owners as well. And then I put this investment by taxpayers because if we think of all of the regulatory agencies, whether that's the cities, whether it's our natural resource districts, whether it's state programs or federal programs, that the goal is to reduce um, nitrate. There's millions of dollars in those programs, both in monitoring, in incentive programs, and in um, regulatory programs. So that is a kind of unseen cost, but it is part of our tax bill each and every year. And finally, at the farm level, um, any farmer who uses fertilizer doesn't want it to go into the groundwater, it needs to go into his crop. Therefore, you know, kind of framing it for them as lost revenue is also really critical. What? And then if we dig into just the filtration costs alone, if you've never seen one in the background, that picture, that's what a community reverse osmosis system looks like. They're quite large. Um, and uh, for example, in the city of Hastings, um, their cost to treat just the nitrate side amounts to $60 a person for every person in the city of Hastings. Um, if you look more generally in our small communities, it gets to be very expensive, depending on how many people you can spread that cost across, because this fancy equipment also needs a professional operator. So you're talking salary, um, and a lot of these little rural villages in the past, they might have one village employee that takes care of everything, not just the water. And so it would be adding salary as well as equipment. And so that cost can get very high up to $650 a person every year. So that starts to add up quite a bit. And then these point of, when I say point of view systems, those are a filter that goes in a home, like for a rural private well, um, depending on how many people you have in the household and you can spread this cost across there again, it's, it's about 50 to $250 a person to um, operate and maintain that filtration system. So these things start to be a challenge for 
rural vitality in general, because most of this is in our more rural part portions of the state. And the last impact I'll just briefly touch on is in our surface water. So mostly I've been talking about what happens in our groundwater, but as we know, first off, they're interconnected. And secondly, some of these fertilizers run off into our surface waterways. Um, with the last water quality report, 83% uh, of our lakes in Nebraska are impaired. And most of that impairment is from excess fertilizer, nitrogen, and phosphorus that can lead to these algae blooms, um, which can have fish kills, or if they're the harmful algae blooms, which is a, another topic that if you want to hear more about, we can, we can have a session on. Those are the ones that if you've seen them in the news, you know, someone's dog jumped in the lake and got sick um, from drinking water. Um, they have toxins that the, al that the algae produces. And so when there's a beach closure, like if you've ever been out to one of the lakes and it says beach, beach watch, the beach is closed, that's from these harmful algal blooms. So all of those are impacts um, in the general sense. So let's dig into um, thinking about how, or how might we personally be impacted. So I'm gonna start out with another question for those of you who can join us on Menti, the, the link is in the chat again or up top. Just wanting to find out uh, who, with who's on, where are you getting your water from? No, oh, so far we've got a mix. Mostly we've got city utilities folks, which isn't surprising. That's most, most of the people in the state are on public water supplies. So that doesn't surprise me too much. Give it just another second here. All right. So I will, I'm, I'm still gonna, we have our one private well person. So we will, we will definitely hit on that piece um, and a little bit about what our city and village folks can do, because it's definitely an upcoming topic for you as well. Okay, so this is kind of fuzzy. I'd love to find a higher resolution image, but you can still get the gist. These are all of the wells that have been tested for nitrate since we've been keeping track of it. Um, we have in Nebraska, we have a very nice, um, data clearing house where any entity, whether it's the university or natural resource district um, or others can put the data. So any, any well that's been tested goes into this clearing house. So anything in red means that it's above background levels or what we would expect to naturally find in our groundwater. Um, and the black ones are the ones that are natural. And so you can see across almost the entire state, we're impacted at some level. The question becomes at, at how, um, how much. And so I, I see a question popped up that I can answer right away is, you know, maybe why are there some of the gaps? You can fill that in. So in some areas, there just aren't very many wells because there's not much groundwater. If that's the question about why Southern Fillmore, and if it's why are there more dots in that area, that's because that natural resource district prioritized testing. So that's Little Blue Natural Resource District, and they have done very extensive testing across their whole district, anywhere where there's wells. And so that's some of why there's more in some places and less in others, is, is how intensively different political entities have, have kind of contributed to this data, which is part of what we'll get to and how we can get involved is, is part of this is, is there some policy. Okay, here's another look at it. This is looking at, instead of just the whole record, this is looking at decade by decade. So what you can see if you start in the upper left, that's um, some of the, there's, there's sampling that goes back to the 1950s. Um, but we started with, this is where there was kind of, you can see there's starting to be a grid 
where we were trying to get a better handle on what was going on. And then it goes down and then up to the top right. And the next is the bottom right. So this is decade by decade. Basically the point being is you, the, the areas with nitrate levels above safe drinking water threshold, which are the red dots, continues to grow. So we've done a few things um, that have slowed it in a few areas, but we are still trending upwards across most of the state. And you'll see these, these pretty much mimic where we grow corn, because that's the most nitro nitrogen intensive crop in the area. The Northern area is which river? So this is the Elkhorn River. I don't know, do I have a, let me see if I have a pointer. Up in Northeast Nebraska, that's the Elkhorn River. But it's not just the river. It's, I mean, some of these are upland, upland areas. It, it pretty well, it pretty well mimics where we, where we grow corn. Um, and when we've done here at our water sciences lab, we've done a lot of this testing. Um, you can look at, is it coming from an organic source like manure versus is it coming from commercial nitrogen? And the vast majority is coming from commercial nitrogen. And, you know, really, as you look at the maps, that's the only thing that covers that extensive of an area. Manure can be an issue in a localized place. Um, so it can be a challenge right around facilities that aren't designed well. Um, but in Nebraska, it's generally, it's, it's the worst in areas that have shallow depth to groundwater. So if the, the purples, that's the Platte River Valley in the center there, that's the Elkhorn. Um, those tend to be sandy soils. The water moves through very fast and takes the fertilizer with it and areas where we're growing a lot of corn. So that's, that tends to be the drivers that, um, as to where it's the worst, um, but you know, it's, it's coming along just more slowly, unfortunately, in many parts of our crop production areas across the state. So kind of this one, this map um, is the one I, I like the best because it kind of helps me see it better than the dots. And so this is an average by township. And so the thing to remember about this is that an individual well can be more or less, it's just an average. And so for example, my township, I live in a rural township on a private well. My township is green, but my well is over 10 parts per million. So just because your township is, is green, we still need to test because it depends on how your, how your individual well, where it's located. But this gives a really good, you know, just kind of, should I be looking, and particularly for communities, um, helps them kind of just real quickly identify, is this a challenge in my area? Here are, and I mentioned before, there's 99 communities that are above five parts per million. And so they're the ones in stars um, on this map. That means they test more frequently just to kind of track it. Um, the ones in purple, that means that they've consistently been above 10 parts per million, and they have to find some way to bring, you know, whether it's a new well or whether they put on filtration, but they have to do something to make sure that they're providing safe drinking water to their community. And then the triangles are communities that have already had to install filtration or some other form of treatment to make, to bring it down because they're up above 10 parts per million. Sorry, it's a little bit slow. So now for the most interesting part, I think, is the discussion of knowing those problems, which many of you on the call might have already known. What are some, what are some things we can do? So I'm going to start out with the private well owners, which I know we only had a, one or two on the call, but for others who might be watching it later, we're also going to, we're going to cover it. So we need to test and test yearly because these numbers are generally trending upwards. Um, so even if your well was safe 10 years ago, you need to test again because it's, it's changing. 
And so the, the in-home way to do that, it's not super accurate, but this picture is of test strips and they're very inexpensive. Um, I kind of like this because it gives me a good judge of, is my filter working? Where am I at? Right there at my house in an inexpensive way. So that's kind of the, the in-home way to do it. Many of the natural resource districts provide free water tests. And so you can go to their websites um, and check that out and see if they offer free tests or sometimes they partner with area high schools to do a free test night. Um, so that's one option to get water tested for free. And then um, commercial lab testing, which is the same type of test the NRD does, but then you can do it anytime you want. Um, it, it costs about $20 um, to send in your water and find out exactly where it's at. And that's kind of, I use these test strips to, this was how I was like, oh, when we, when we moved in, we knew we were up over five, but they're kind of fuzzy. So I'm like, okay, we better just get it. We better just get it tested. Um, Cause this will give you a more accurate number than the div test. And the question is, can you buy test strips yourself? Yes. Um, I know I've searched them on Amazon, but we don't have to just sponsor Google. I'm sure there's uh, Google or Amazon. Um, there's other options, but yes, you can, you can just search them. I buy them online. I, if anybody knows of where to buy them in person in the area, you can put it in the chat, but I usually buy them online. And this one that I have pictured here, this one, obviously, you can see the top two, if you look on the right, the top two are nitrate and nitrate. And then it's got a couple other things. So you can get tests, test strips that test for other things, because nitrate is not the only thing. It is the most common thing, but it's not the only thing that might show up in your water. So with that, quick question. For those of you who have private wells, which like I said, it may just be the one person still unless someone's joined us, but have you, have you tested your water? Sorry, I don't, I don't know you by name, so it's not totally calling you out, but we don't have a group to average across. Occasionally, yeah, that was where I was at too. Even as someone who's really involved with water, I did not, it's one of those that it's, it doesn't often pop up as, as something to remember to do. So with that, um, there's several different types of filters for private home systems. Um, you can go, the one pictured, that's an under the sink type filter. Um, that This one happens to be a reverse osmosis system that you set up a separate tap. Um, there's different ways that it can be, you can make sure that it gets plumbed into your refrigerator. If your refrigerator is the main place um, that you get drinking water, um, you can put it in multiple locations. If you've got, like I know some people have out in their barn, they have a fancy entertainment area. So wherever drinking water is used uh, needs to have a system on it is the main question, is the main point. You can buy full house systems, um, but you don't, for drinking water, these are under the sink type things are sufficient. And if we want more information, again, it'll be at the end. We can do a whole session on, on filtering and testing to kind of get more details. And so there again, Question for our private well owner on the call. Just wondering if you if you have a filter, what kind? Very cool. Awesome. Glad to hear that your water is is in good shape. So our next piece. Oh, sorry, I had one more question. Alice. It feels like a lot. I feel like I'm, this is the last one for, for our one well owner on the call. <laughs> um, but just when, you know, put yourself, and others can answer this one too. It's 
since we don't have a lot of people, just as you put yourself in in people's shoes, how would you rate the different barriers to getting a filter? I know personally, I was really sad to put it on because the water doesn't taste as good. I had amazing water and now it's just very average. <laughs> Well, thanks. Thanks for the other person who jumped in. So now we'll switch to community water supplies. Um, public water supplies is another name for it. So I know we've got a few more people interested in that. So just so you do know, every public water supply, which I believe is more than 15 people on a system. I might have that. I should have looked that number up. But when you have a public water supply, it falls under the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Water Act, and they currently require testing for 90 different compounds. Um, and so those tests have to be done at least yearly, some of them are quarterly, some things cities monitor on an, on an hour by hour basis, things like pH and other things like that that really impact the system. Um, they're monitoring it very frequently. So that is that is one advantage of being on a public water supply is there's um, there are professional staff keeping track of the safety of your water. Um, but like I've mentioned a couple of times, one of the challenges is for a lot of our very small communities, um, this hasn't been an issue in the past. They had wells, they had plenty of water that was clean. Therefore, they don't, they didn't have to, they did this once a year and they didn't have a lot of infrastructure to do it. Um, but now that we've got so many communities that are trending upwards, this is going to continue to be a challenge um, and an investment, probably statewide, because a lot of the, a lot of those communities, as they look for a new system, they get state or federal grants. And so that cost then gets spread across um, all of us, whether we live in that community or not. So to me, the best way to do this is to get involved. I'm going to share a few of the um, different efforts that are going on around this space. Uh, as I started out with, I'll put up all of our logos again. Uh, we started this Nebraska Nitrate Network, um, which Conservation Nebraska is a partner on and several others. Um, so you can encourage the organizations or the boards that you work with to join this effort uh, and to work together. What that group decided, so our very first meeting was just saying, what, what is our big goal? This is nothing groundbreaking, but sometimes it just helps to write these things down. And so our big audacious goal that we established last year was that all Nebraskans will drink safe water, which like I said, it's nothing groundbreaking, seems like it should be the standard. Um, but like I said, in those private wells, we don't really have a good, um, even a good handle on whether people are, and if, if they aren't, do they know that they need to be? So we established three working, or four working groups, I should say, coming out of that. We've had probably over a hundred now, because I got a bunch of new people at, since I did this slide a couple of months ago. Need to update it. Because we're pushing over, we got over 100 people and pushing 40 uh, different organizations now. So the awareness group actually just met yesterday. Um, we're we're going to target those private well owners first um, to make sure that they know um, how to test, how to understand that test, and and um, how to get a filter if they need it. Because they're really the the biggest kind of wild card. They're the immediate folks under immediate risk if they're drinking high nitrate water. Um, and then we've got a couple education working groups. Um, so these are looking at getting at the root cause of the challenge. So we've got some on-farm discussion of on-farm education and research, as well as working with our schools to help um, students both understand their own water as well as maybe be future water professionals in this space. And then finally, we had a policy working group um, that's discussing are there different ways that 
policy can help incentivize this process or set some minimum bars. So just a bit more on that awareness group. Um, we're developing shared communication resources. So just amongst all these organizations, when we have events, do we have materials that we can share, things that have been um, well-designed and vetted instead of recreating the wheel each time we do this? And then kind of along down the line, what we're hoping to do over the next year is really work with local folks um, to help them champion it in their local communities and help deliver programming. And there's an app under development because there's always an app for that, right? At the state and local level, um, wanted to share, this is, I think the most up-to-date map of, of communities and natural resource districts that are working with Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy to develop non-point source pollution management plans. And so there, that's places that are actively thinking about how do we um, manage this going into the future. And so we've got a handful of communities kind of working on that. And then small, small communities within these NRDs can use this plan. And this is part of the basis as well as um, there's grant funding through EPA to address non-point source pollution. But the first step is having a plan. And so um, once these folks are done, then they're eligible to receive some of that funding to put their plan into place. Um, a very related um, piece of that, because it's also through Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy, is uh, this is their source water protection priority map. And so all the little red dots are wellhead protection areas. That's a voluntary program that's been around for quite some time where communities can, um, they identify uh, with the help of the experts at NDEE, they identify where their water for their town is going to come from, you know, so based on which direction the groundwater is flowing and that sort of thing. So they map out an area around town um, and just say, hey, it's kind of an awareness piece to let the landowners in that area know, hey, that what you do on this land um, affects the community's water supply. So that's a voluntary program. And then the NRDs have, um, they call it phase management of, of nitrogen. This is uh, just showing all areas that are two or higher. Most of them are in phase two or three, and there are some um, basic regulations that go along with those. Each NRD is slightly different, so you can look up um, on their web pages exactly what sort of policy your local natural resource district is using, but those are the orange areas um, across there. And then on farm, and like I said, any of these we can dig into more. I'll ask that at the end. And then on farm, there's kind of four main broad areas that um, in order to level up as a farmer, if you want to put it that way, you have to manage all of these well at the same time. And that's what makes this a challenge. And the, you know, in the wild card in here that I didn't list is, is the weather can always put our best laid plans um, to waste as we saw yesterday with the wind. But basically we wanna manage our irrigation water because how much water is running through the soil matters because it brings that nitrate and other ag chemicals. Like I said, I'm mostly talking about nitrate, but there are other agrochemicals that travel easily with the water. Um, and then fertilizer is the same way. You wanna just spoon feed that crop so that you don't have extra sitting in the soil. Soil health improves both those things. The better the soil functions, the better um, we can do in managing our irrigation fertilizer and then cropping system itself. So in Nebraska, we grow corn, mostly corn, sometimes corn and beans but finding ways to diversify that system, whether it's adding cover crops, whether it's adding a small grain, um, there's, there's a kind of a host of things within that systems level piece. So 
So, and I, the, well, the one piece I want to end on is I think the most effective way to get involved is just to share your voice. You know, this is the same across a variety of uh, environmental topics is, is just being able to share um, your interest and your passion, talking with your neighbors, that interpersonal connection. I know it feels like we're very um, divided as a country right now, but still these interpersonal conversations, probably less online, more in person, is, is some of the most effective ways still to, to, to move this forward. And, and that can be that can be those one-on-ones, but it can also be policy conversations. Since I know Conservation Nebraska, that's a big part of what they do is, is attending local board meetings. It can be getting involved in election issues or you know, working with candidates who have um, similar goals as you do and just letting candidates know that this is a priority topic for you. So finding different ways to share your voice is, is one of the best ways to get involved. Um, I will say before I ask you what else you wanna hear about, we do have a water quality and public health series planned out. Um, this is with UNMC as well as extension. And so this starts in January. So if the health piece in particular is of interest to you, we're gonna go in depth on on the on water and health and so i'll invite you to i'll put these links in the chat here in just a second um you can also um let us know what else you'd like to hear through conservation nebraska in our next poll here there we go so i've been promising it all along here's our what do you want to hear more about and after this, I will, uh, I think I've got one more question after this, and then I can also open it up to other questions, but I'll wait while you guys are voting. Yep, Charlene says the farm is where we need to start. And I think it's both because even if we stopped all fertilizer today, which would be, you know, we have we do have to think about how we do this in a way that um, that balances things. But even if we stopped every bit of fertilizer today, there is still a lot of nitrate already in the soil. And so no matter what, there's a lot of private wells that need filters, no matter what we do at the farm. So I think it's both. I think we, in order to address that there are health risks today. So there are, you know, my personal, um, you know, you always, it's good to think of why do you do these things? One of my biggest whys is for expectant mothers who are near and dear to my heart, it matters today what they're drinking. That infant is in a critical, you know, so when I talk to the UNMC folks, you know, for developmental disorders, there's like a one week window when it matters. And so if they get too much that week, it mattered. So to me, I'm like, it matters to those parents and families today, what's in their water. So that's why I'm like, we need to address those that are most at risk. And for sure, we have to also talk about how do we address the root cause, which is the fertilizer going into, into the soil. So I will Click ahead one more, give you a chance to answer that. Feel free to put any more questions into the chat. Um, we've got a few minutes here, 10 minutes. You wanna talk about more of those. And Ch Ch oh, not Chelsea. Sorry, it says Chelsea. You're fine. I know, Ashley, I know. It's Ashley, I'll flip it over so you can bring up your questions nice, um, okay. here in just a minute. I'll give, I'll give no a little bit longer to answer this. Okay, so another question is, I heard that nitrate 
is affecting arsenic levels too. Is that correct? Um, I'm less familiar with its effect on arsenic. I it is. I know for sure it impacts how much uranium ends up in our water. And so there were some studies done here at UNL several years ago now that show that with higher nitrate in the soil, it was allowing uranium that's already present. So we have kind of naturally occurring low levels of uranium in our soils, but usually it stays really tightly connected to the soil, but Something they haven't, that's what kind of they've been doing follow up research since then. They don't know exactly what the process is, whether it's a microbial or it's a physical process, but something is happening that with high nitrate, it releases more uranium. And so, cities like Hastings, that's one of the things they're having to watch very closely. Um, part of their filtration system is also to lower uranium levels. I think. If I remember right, Grand Island and McCook, they also, their filtration is for uranium as well as, as well as the nitrate. So that one for sure, I, I'd have to get back to you on the arsenic question. Other questions, and let me give control to Chelsea, or sorry, Ashley. It's no, hard to say someone else's name when I see it written right there. I'm not worried about it. I can't go in and change it otherwise I would, but I'm fine with being healthy <laughs> for a day. Okay, next question is, how do farm groups and commodity boards, or how have they been engaged in driving changes in behavior management or technology? And so I would say, um, you know, our commodity boards across the state have always been very involved in research in how to use inputs more efficiently. That's a longstanding partnership um, where, where they've been helping fund research into um, technologies and management that make us more efficient. And, um, and so from that sense, you know, at the farm gate, they're, they're very interested in helping farmers be more efficient. I think part of the challenge as a state we will have to figure out is can we achieve, how do we get there when there's potential for, how can we achieve it when both, how do I wanna say this? When only growing corn may not be able to achieve clean water goals. And so, you know, there's conflicting goals there. We want to have the most profitable farming system, but yet we need to have clean water. And these are often the same people, you know, this impacts the farmers well that lives right there. And so it's even an internal debate is, do we have a system that can have both that short-term economic as well as the long-term health and economics? How do we find a balance? I think is the real question um, for the state is can, can we get there with our current system? And if not, how do we, I mean, some of that is like federal farm policy questions and it's, um, you know, how that international markets and all that meets at the farm level and encourages or discourages systems that are a challenge for the people here in the state. So hopefully that's not too fuzzy of an answer, but it's messy. It's, it's, uh, it, if it were easy, we would have figured it out a long time ago because that's one of the pieces we talked about when we launched this is that um, I'm newer to it and a few of us are newer to it, but some of the people in our group, they're like, we've been talking about nitrates for four decades. You know, like it's it's not a new problem. It's a difficult one. And so it's something we're gonna have to wrestle with as a state um, to find solutions that can move us forward. And I and like I said it's it's not that nothing there have been definite improvements in efficiencies, um, but we're not there yet. Any other questions? We got a couple minutes here. I'm going to go ahead and pop yeah, up. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
our poll really quick, just if everybody could go ahead and take a few moments, please and thank you. Without any further questions, I want to thank everybody who joined us today. Um, glad to continue this conversation as well as uh, get you involved. If you're interested in doing that, feel free to reach out. Um, I think, yep, if it'll let me go. Here's my, here's my email address. If you want to get a hold of me, I can plug you in. Um, or if you want to get more involved with Conservation Nebraska. I'm sure Ashley would be glad to help you do that as well. Absolutely. And I'll send out a follow-up email in the next 24 hours that's got some of the presentations that Crystal has posted, a few others that Conservation Nebraska are taking part of in sort of a separate capacity, but all with the same goal in mind. Um, and I'll try to look up for sure if there's any local places that sell test strips so we can try to help and continue improve our own local economic vitality. But yeah, if no other questions, thank you so much, Crystal, for you being here. You were amazing. I loved this um, mentee style of presentation. I would definitely love to be a part of more for sure. Yep, it's fun. I like, I like hearing from some of you. We've done so many webinars that it's like, how can we, how can we be a bit more interactive? And seeing the results in real time is also makes it even more exciting. So. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end it, and I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening.